And, you know, uh, Mr. Faruti, he doesn't need a lot of introduction, but uh, I was joking with him that uh, you can actually uh, introduce him as a retired lawyer, you know. I mean, oh, yeah. You'd be very correct to say that. All right. So, so I, I want to start this conversation uh, around the question of judicial reform and judicial ethics. Now, uh, okay. I, I think many Nigerians, especially people in the legal profession, and, and many of us who are also involved in public life, we, we have a clear understanding that there has to be uh, quite a bit of reform, generally in our society, but especially in the judiciary. So, so I want to start from for your own perspective. You have practiced law uh, certainly for more than two decades uh, before you opted, I guess, to, to be a private citizen doing something else. What are the major, what are the major uh, reforms that you think ought to take place in our judiciary? Well, um, we are as a people quite fond of doing what Yorubas would call we ignore the leprosy and embark on ringworm curing exercises. It is not arguable that the Nigerian judiciary is in serious need, very urgent need of a turnaround. But when you look at it almost like it is only our judiciary and by curing that problem, we would have resolved each and every one of our problems, it would be rather simplistic for anyone to make such pronouncements. But it is critical that the foundation of any state, which is the rule of law, must be strengthened by ensuring that proper, fit and proper persons are the ones to be found in the judicial system. That would, of course, demand that the entire process of appointment and selection of judicial officers must be revisited. It cannot continue to be a place for prebendal um, expression of power and largesse. It cannot be a place where, because you are the CJ, your sons and daughter, daughter-in-laws, cousins, uncle, goats, qualified or not qualified, all of a sudden it becomes a, a qualified for judicial appointment. It cannot be a place that where, where you reward people who have been loyal to you, regardless of whether their loyalty is backed by patriotism to the country itself. It cannot just be a reward for the good old boys and girls who have served the system, which is what it has essentially been reduced to. And when you look at the end product, which should be the dispensation of justice, and you see that there is little or no justice available to anyone within the country, not even the rich and mighty and powerful any longer, because what you now find are cacophonies of noises issuing forth from different courts, sometimes of coordinate jurisdiction saying different things. Look at the Kano situation, for instance. It says a lot about what has happened to us. When is a poor man who is in need of urgent judicial relief? You won't hear a thing. Nobody is offering anything. He might be there for the next five years without his case ever seeing the light of day. But look at how many injunctions fly over all over the place. Once is the high and mighty, the powerful and the rich that are involved, even when it's their petty squabbles. But so when we're talking about judiciary reform, we must understand clearly that the judiciary is but one out of the many aspects of our country that has more or less collapsed. It's only reflective of everything else. It's reflective of our educational system. It's reflective of everything about our country has come to the critical point where we must look at it honestly and stop lying to ourselves about giant of Africa and all the many lies that we tell ourselves to cover the truth of the destruction wanton destruction of our country by those who have claimed to rule it. So, yes, we need urgent judiciary reforms, but it goes beyond just looking at the judiciary. It's easier to despair when we look at our case, but yes, the judiciary needs urgent, 
urgent reform. It's not just about the human resource, even structural. There are urgent needs for serious structural reform in the judiciary. There is need to fund it properly. There is need to be deliberate about dispensing justice and not just appearing to be paying lip service. How do you explain the way it is? Look at the number of people awaiting trials in our courts and we claim to have a judicial system. It's a disgrace. So, so I wanted to also, um, you know, in, in breaking it down, I, I, I see two issues essentially, you know, when we're talking about judicial reforms. Of course, we, we are looking at the rules, you know, what the regulations are, uh, the, 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 the laws as it were. Are there some of them that needed to change, you know? And then there's also the issue of ethics, which is how those laws, those regulations, those rules are applied, misapplied, used, or abused. So I wanted to ask you, uh, Bradley, you know, in your own view, which is the more uh, compelling problem of the judiciary? Is it about the rules that needs to change, the regulations, or the ethical question? Look, your rubbers will say, on la mokon, erwe wo, olori le en wo e wo sale. So you say to the crippled man with the load on his head, oh, your load is lopsided. And he responds, you will call it lopsided because you're focused on the load on my head without looking at the crookedness of my feet. Let's be clear about something. There are sufficient rules in our books that should have stopped the retired Chief Justice of Nigeria from appointing members of his families as judicial officers. The Judicial Code of Conduct was sufficient and you wouldn't ever have heard of any such thing before Nigeria began its speedy descent into the abyss of impunity. So when you hear me saying that Corruption is not our problem in Nigeria. It is impunity. I will link it to the issue of whether it's about ethics or whether it's about a paucity of laws. We have enough laws in our books. We have enough rules in our books that should prevent the egregious abuses that we see on a daily basis that has debased our judicial system and rendered it completely unfit for purpose. There are more than enough laws and rules. So this is not about the paucity of written guidance on what should be done or not done by persons within the system. It is, a com it is, it is about a complete disregard for law. We don't even pretend that the laws matter any longer. Corruption is when the system says something should be done in a particular order or form, and then somebody is giving undue pecuniary benefit, and they then circumvent the system by speeding it up or doing something, maybe qualifying somebody who shouldn't qualify. That is corruption. But when you see a situation where people simply walk to the answer without caring anything for the process, that is what has happened to us. The same way they do wuru to the answer, in answering university exam questions, promoting people within the system. It is the same thing they are doing in the judiciary. So even in judicial pronouncements now, you now see ever more ridiculous, obscene, and silly pronouncements issuing forth because there is simply, there are simply no longer any regard have or had to common sense what should be. Look. We have departed from the path of sense. That is why you have so many abominations flying up and down the place. It's about who has the power. Once they have the power, they don't care about consequence. They care nothing about it. So this is no longer, our case has moved beyond whether if we, we are talking about ethics. Who is going to enforce the ethics? Who will enforce it? In the absence of a societal decision to walk away from this ruinous path that we have all appeared, we all appear to have embraced as a collective. Because you would imagine that if the judiciary 
went mad like ours appear to have gone crazy, then maybe the religious orders, whether that be Muslim or Christian, would even have something to say to speak to the complete absence of justice, manifest and complete absence of justice from our system. But which one of them have you heard saying anything? Who has said a word? So it's not just about the judiciary. It's just that it is easier to point at the judiciary because if you hear, if you heard the rumbling of thunder, you know, you, it's easy for you to say rain is coming. So when what should be the last hope of the common man has become as hopeless as our own judiciary has obviously become, then it becomes alarming and we start talking about the judiciary. But which part of our lives as Nigerians really, really in truth encourages any hope? We all need to actually look at ourselves and tell ourselves the truth that what we have done to ourselves, our children, is not sustainable. We've destroyed this country and if we don't call ourselves back, it will be beyond redemption very soon. How do you... I'm a lawyer. I was trained as one. I would even go as far as to sometimes argue that perhaps I was born one. But here is the thing. Even me, I can. I have cases in the system. I went to court knowing I won't get justice. Just for the record, just so that people will not say, what did you do about it? That's how hopeless our judiciary has become. Only the rich can get any vestige of justice within the system. Only the rich. Only the rich and the powerful. The judicial system has become a tool for the oppression of the weak. People went out to protest on, I'm sorry, I need to make this point. People went out to protest against hunger. They went out to protest against hunger. You had somebody like Wike, governments all over the place, even the ones in Lagos State, they rushed all over the place, went to the court, the court, to go and get injunction against people looking to protest. They used the judiciary to uncuff citizens, quote and unquote, who presume to demand the right to peaceful protest. The judiciary was, the, what, what, they used judges to issue pronouncements. To make the matter worse, the state went ahead and charged peaceful protesters for treason. Treason. You want to criminalize the right of protest? Treason. Hungry people came out, you are selling them daily and you are criminalizing protests and the judiciary has become complicit in the oppression and suppression of the Nigerian people. So if the people lose hope in the judiciary as they have, I have lost hope completely in the judiciary. That's the honest to God truth. If the people lose hope in the judiciary, what is left? Clearly, uh, there, there, there are quite... Uh, uh, a, a few people too who share uh, those sentiments. You know, we have seen instances of uh, very troubling decisions, and uh, you know, and I'm sure that there are even deeper issues that most people don't know about. But before we get uh, uh, too deep into it, we had on, on this show um, uh, Chief Kanu Agabi, uh, two-time uh, Attorney General of the Federation, and we were talking about you know, the judiciary. And his argument was that, look, the judges have been overworked. And he said that whatever it is that we see happening in the judiciary is because the judges have been overworked. He gave an example and said that, look, uh, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are judges who have to deal with as much as 20 or 30 uh, cases in one day. You know, uh, I even said that, look, he has worked in the executive as attorney general. He has worked in the legislature as a senator. And being a lawyer, he has worked in the judiciary. That he still thinks that the, the judiciary is still the best. Now, the reason why I brought that one up uh, is to say that certainly you two must think that there are still some good judges that are working in what you believe to be a bad system. Do you, do you, I mean, how do you respond to that? Let me put it this way. Every system is made up of persons. So every system is only as strong 
or as weak as the persons who make up the system. If you have a hundred judges and you can only point at perhaps maybe five, maybe 10, or even if you are generous, let's say 50 out of a hundred, and that is me being overly generous, let's say 50 out of a hundred can be said to be above board and capable of dispensing justice. And let's be clear, corruption is not only about collecting money to pervert justice within the system. Corruption is making up your mind about the case before you even heard the matter because of your own prejudices. So when you have a situation where a fair amount, even if it's 10 out of a hundred that are corrupt within a judicial system, that's bad enough. But our judiciary is not any different from our police or our custom or our clergy or our teachers or our mechanics or our doctors for that matter. They are horse. So when we start talking about our judges and yeah, there are good ones amongst them. I've had occasion, I've, I've been at the mercy of this same judiciary that I speak about all the time. I had a case where I was pursued through the court. I was convicted at the high court. It took the mercies of the Court of Appeal Justices who reviewed the appeal to quash my conviction. So it's not as if I'm speaking to a place where I am an angel and everybody are devils or demons. No, it's about the system that we have built. Even when good judges are within the system, the administrative judges will not give them cases that involves persons of power where they know that the judge would not do their bidding. These are things that lawyers know. There was once upon a time in this Lagos state when a particular person was in power as governor in Lagos state, when you sued Lagos state, and that is the practice until today, if you sue a Lagos state agency or you sue the Lagos state government, you'll be collecting dates when the judges knew they would not even be sitting. So you might have a case in court for the next five years. Every time you went to court, you are going to get an adjournment because you are suing the parties that may not be sued. That's the kind of system that we have evolved. We have, we've evolved the best that our judicial system can deliver the way it is currently is maybe the administration of impunity. So you just take care of those that must not be touched and at best give the semblance of justice to the victims of the system. But we've not evolved a judicial system that is truly capable of upholding the rule of law, dealing with everybody as equals, and truly being blind as the goddess of justice is meant to be, holding a just scale and a sword that would do justice as between the parties that are before it, until our country is structured to deliver justice until the judges themselves are related to the people to whom they are meant to be dispensing justice, until each and every one of us understand the fact that the more we weaken the fabric of the society by making all these exceptions for persons that have rendered the system incapable of dispensing justice to all, our system is bound to grind to a halt one day the way we are going. Mm. Quite, uh, quite, 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 quite sad. All right. I mean, so, so I, I have, I have uh, read a book that you, uh, I think you, you must have written this book quite recently. Uh, is the Nigeria and its criminal justice system. And, you know, what, what, what really struck me about the book was the case that you narrated whereby, uh, there was a land matter in, uh, I think it's Lekki, you know, uh, Os Osapa area, where, according to your book, the matter got to the Supreme Court. I think it was a case uh, that involved the uh, some of the families. I think there was a contest about I mean, a, a particular portion of land. Uh, and the matter got to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court made a ruling that gave judgment to the Eletu Badamosi family, 10 acres, if, if I got the, uh, the, the, the number right. And then, uh, as you reported in the book, that their lawyer, 
went back to the Supreme Court and got the Supreme Court to increase the, 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 the allocation of the hectares after the Supreme Court itself had said, look, this family, all you can, all you get here is 10 acres. And then, then, so, so, I mean, something happened, they weren't satisfied, went back, and the Supreme Court, in your book your, that you reported, gave the family uh, almost or close to 250 acres. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Dede, can you just summarize to us what happened in that case for the benefit of our viewers uh, before we now try and, you know, because I, I, I have, I think this is something that we should look closely at. Can you give us a summary what happened in that case? I thank God for the grace of life that I managed to write the book, that I'm alive to defend the truth, which requires no defense, that each and every one of the persons that I mentioned in the book are alive and well and able to deny what I have written concerning what transpired. But in order to answer your question, I'm giving this background so that I need people to understand very clearly that I'm not about persons. I don't really care much for persons. We are all bit part players. However high or low, we'll spend our time here and then we'll go. But we would all render account for whatever we do with our life. So here is the thing. When I was much younger in practice, my first law office worked for the Ojomu family. They were more or less exclusively the lawyers for the Ojomu chieftaincy family. So I grew up in practice within that space and I was fortunate to have, you know how you, when you are in a space, you hear different things. So I'd heard about the case involving the Ojomus and the Elechus since my very early years in practice. That case was at the time freshly decided at the High Court, and then it later moved on to the Court of Appeal. And it spent quite a while there, but eventually it came out, and the Court of Appeal still gave, uh, gave victory to the Ujomuns. But I kept following these over the course of time, but because I lived in the neighborhood, I live in the neighborhood as well as practice in that neighborhood as well. So. I knew from way back that some people named the Eletu family and Badamoshi Eletu had purchased land from the Ojomu family. And I knew that there had been that grievance about some fraudulence in relation to the deed. So by the time my clients were purchasing things in that neighborhood and they were asking questions about what kind of legal risks they might be running, I was careful to explain to them because I had studied the case from very early in my practice that, well, the totality of argument was restricted, obviously, to a very small part. So I gave legal advice based on my knowledge, not just of the law, but of the facts. So by the time the Supreme Court did deliver this judgment, I believe that must be in 2012, 2013. I can't really remember now. And... Um, the elite two families started going around the whole of Osaka, part of Ajiron, Agungi area, marking buildings, claiming that the Supreme Court had given them 254 hectares of land. I knew something fishy was going on. So immediately I asked a counsel in Abuja to procure the judgment of the Supreme Court as well as the enrolled order of the court. And we looked at it and we, we again advised our clients that they had nothing to worry about because they, a case was instituted earlier on, I believe that was in 1993, M779-93, I believe. Yes, that case was between the LA2 people and Lagos State Government. And the LA2 had settled their claim in relation to the 254 hectares in question. So the doctrine of estopel in law would obviously have stopped them from claiming anything more. In addition to the fact that the land had already been acquired and then subsequently given out to many people by Lagos State Government C of O. So I knew something fishy was going on when they made these assertions. I looked at the judgment. We advised our clients to ignore them, but we reached out so that we could understand the basis of their claim. Long story cut short, um, they attempted enforcement. We ended up in court. The 
order for enforcement that the gods was quashed, all this is in the book. Then the gremlins sprang up again and went back to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, without any basis in law or common sense for that matter, in gross, in gross violation of each and every one of their own rule of practice, Supreme Court, without the benefit of survey in front of it, was busy multiplying and dividing land. Land without surveying, something that was never pled in any part, whether in the lower court, court of appeal, was never raised and could never have been raised. So I, I know that it got to a point that the matter got to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court yes. said that the elite should get about 10 hectares. Okay? Yes. And then, and just a minute, just, just a minute, you know, and, and, and then uh, there was an attempt to file a writ of possession. Uh, that went beyond 10 hectares. Is that what happened? Yes. Uh -huh. So, so, I, 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 so I, want, I want our viewers to follow that, uh, that no sequence. Yeah. Let, me, let me share that with you. So there was a previous case that I have mentioned, M779-93. It was a case involving the Elitu and Lagos State. And in that case, a settlement was reached. Elitus were to accept 10 hectares of land in full and final settlement of their claim against Lagos State. The same Lagos State against whom they are settled were the ones who issued title to everybody because they had by then acquired each and every land in the Lekki Peninsula. They revoked all rights, customary and statutory, to every land in the entire axis, gazetted it, and subsequently, when they settled with the Elitu, that was filed as the judgment of the court. So the elitus could no longer be asserting any claim. And that was what the Supreme Court said that what you have been given in M779, the Supreme Court was careful. It was Akaz, JSC, that delivered the lead judgment. And he said clearly that the fruit of their judgment given in M779-93, they should go and enjoy it. That is their own. Which are the 10 hectares? So the, by the time they got to Lagos to file for enforcement, somebody fraudulently, fraud, I repeat it again, fraudulently underlined the consenting judgment of Rosvivor, JSC as it then was, where he said, they had equitable, in, unextinguished equitable interest in 254 hectares. Unextinguished equitable interest. Where that equitable interest is supposed to stand is left to him, but it was something said in consenting to the judgment of Akaas, which gave only 10 hectares. They then underlined that portion of the judgment Without the enrolled order of the Supreme Court, they came to Lagos State and applied for a writ of possession, and they got it from the judge in Lagos State, the admin judge in the Lagos Division, gave them a writ of possession for 254 hectares. Instead of 10? Instead of 10, which was what the court gave. She proceeded to issue a writ for 254 hectares. So when they attempted to enforce this, of course, we resisted enforcement and then went back to court. Remember this, they never filed the enrolled order of the Supreme Court in getting that order to enforce, a, to enforce judgment on 254 hectares based on the consenting judgment of Rosvival where he was talking about unextinguished equitable interest. So when they attempted this enforcement, we resisted it, wrote multiple petitions, including ones asserting criminal allegations against the, the lawyers who were attempting to enforce this fraud. And eventually, as I narrated in the book, that order was quashed. When the order was quashed, the beneficiaries of the original fraud ran back to the Supreme Court that whatever it was they might have agreed as between themselves hasn't been delivered because this troublesome lawyer in Lagos 
as this judgment that has, as this ruling that has quashed the thing. So they now resorted, they claimed that they had a clerical error to correct. Supreme Court became mathematician. They were removing, subtracting, adding. Survey that nobody ever played. I'm not even sure even they ever saw any survey because nobody was ever served any motion again because the Supreme Court claimed, claimed when lawyers rose in the Supreme Court to show the Supreme Court that you cannot do this. They said, no, they, can, they, are, they are not doing anything. They are correcting clerical error. Clerical error. Up until today, they cannot enforce that judgment because they know, everybody knows that it's a fraud. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. You know, so, 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 and that's the, uh, the, the, that seems to be the redemptive, uh, uh, point about, about that, uh, that case. The fact that nobody is trying, uh, to, to enforce it. Uh, but, but, but it turns out, as, as it was narrated in the book, you, you, you made that point that the, 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 the lawyers who got Supreme Court to now say it's 250 hectares instead of 10, uh, seem to fall out with the Eletu family. And then another lawyer started to take the matter up and the, the, the senior lawyer went to, uh, to ICPC to, to, to now challenge that other lawyer. Can you tell us that story, Mr. Uh, Mr. No, Dillon? Is, is there a story to tell? It's not mine. I generally try to avoid talking about persons. The only thing I'll say about that is this. I probably would never have known of the horrible libel that Chivafe Babalola had against me in his letter to the then um, Chief Judge of Lagos State, Ayomide Phillips. I would never have known of what transpired if there hadn't ensued this quarrel between Chivafe Babarola and Lawa Pedro. But it was Lawa Pedro grabbing her first client that led Lawa Pedro to, 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 that led her first to go and write petition to ICPC. That was the first time I became aware that something funny was going on. Oh, Chivafe Babarola, I believe, wrote the petition to ICPC complaining, and I think the L LPDC as well, complaining, look, I know that they fell out. Eventually, the matter ended up in the Lagos State High Court. So the only relevance of their squabble, which I know transcended whether it was LPDC or IP, ICPC and then ended up in the court, that's the extent of my interest in their squabble. Because if they were not quarreling, I would never, have, I would have been blissfully unaware of what had transpired. Okay, now, so uh, let me just say for purposes of uh, 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 objectivity and fairness, that of course we we we, we are open to uh, the, the names of the lawyers that have been mentioned uh, to also come up with their own side of the story. Uh, this is by no means uh, uh, a, a, a one-sided uh, stuff. We, we want, if they want to, we are open to them also giving us their side of the story. The important thing that we are trying to uh, do here is to ensure uh, that there is fairness and objectivity uh, to all. Now, I would say that, you know, uh, Mr. Dede, I want us to now move to State of the Nation. We actually have systemic collapse staring us in the face. If we are going to be able to solve these problems, it would have to be because we decided as a collective that we must change things around. So if I'm speaking only to the judiciary, it's a waste of time. I understand. And that's, that, that's actually the basis of my next question. So... Uh, when, when, when one takes a look at some of this, you know, this kind of situation and several others that we have seen in society, it just reminds you of the imperative of the rule of law. Because, you know, uh, you will always, even in this, in, 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 in the, in the facts that you detailed in your book. So, so, and I, I, I I'm quite intrigued about what happened between those two lawyers, you know, uh, one seemed to be able to exact uh, a lot of influence on a particular court in Abuja. Uh, another seemed to be able to exact influence in particular courts in Lagos. And this is th this is the imperative of the rule of law. Now, I'm, I'm sure that you, you know, uh, you and a lot of our viewers understand how 
the rule of law became uh, a question of enlightened self-interest. And that's the point, that, that's where I'm going, that it is in the interest of all of us, especially the elites, because you don't know when you're going to be out of favor, you're going to know when you're going to be out of power, a time is going to come when the only defense and protection that you're going to have is actually that it is the law that is ruling, not uh, your interest, not that you have friends or influence. So, so that brings me to the question of elite consensus. I don't know whether we have discussed this before, but I wanted to take it there and you, know, you are free to take it whichever way you choose. Is it not time for the Nigerian elite, you know, as part of how we can begin to reform our entire society, to be able to say that, look, these are the, 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 these are the minimum levels and standards of operation, be it in politics, be it in, in the judiciary, be it in education, be it in business, that look, these are the minimum. And one of them is to enforce and ensure that we have the rule of law. Your take, uh, Mr. Fawaitimi. Me, as you would have recalled from our past conversations, I'm big on linguistic exactitude. So when you use the phrase, the Nigerian elite, question is, who is the Nigerian elite? Sybaritic, myopic, people consumed by consumption. They don't think beyond what they will eat next, what they will drink. That's the only thing that ever crosses their minds. It's just about existing. They don't think beyond their lifetime. All they focus on is a stupid acquisition of money, obscene, obscene display of debauchery of all sorts, ever more debased acquisition of the commonwealth. Are those the ones you call elite? Mindless pursuit of money as if they are going to live forever. They live stupidly consumed by the pursuit of money. We don't have elites in Nigeria. We have no elites in Nigeria. If we were a country blessed with an elite class, they would have demanded better, both of themselves and of the society they have built. You know the tragedy of the people you are calling elite? The pinnacle of their achievement in their own eyes is their capacity to buy homes abroad and send their children abroad and be able to take their children abroad. They build things that they can, their children cannot even inherit. They are building a country that their children can't survive in. Are those the ones you are calling elite? Which elite? Nigeria is not blessed with an elite class. Wherever you look at it, whether it's in the academia, whether it's in politics, whether it's in the economy itself, which elite? The only thing they compete about is uh, my big guy, my, uh, my, my private jet is bigger than yours. That's all now. Which elite? What, are, what is elite about our society? Exactly what have they done in the society that is suggestive of a people that may be considered elite? What elite? All of them are carrying second passports. Each and every one of the person you may call elite in Nigeria today has a second passport. If the British who governs us indirectly or the Americans who benefit from our putrefaction have not granted them either permanent stay or residence or their passport, their children are carrying it or they will go and buy one of the Mediterranean countries' passports or they will go to say, all these funny countries, Grenadine, this one, that one, each and every, including your traditional rulers, they all carry all these funny passports up and down the place. Are those the ones you are calling elite? Elites living in slums, those are the elites. We have no elites in Nigeria. Don't let's fool ourselves. We have no elites. So please, stop. You don't have an elite. I'm sorry to say. There is no elite in Nigeria. Please. But my, my point, I, and, I, and I understand your, your sentiments, uh, Mr. Favoritimi. My, my, my point is that we must find, we must find, and I know that you believe that a lot of these things are hopeless, but we must, to, for, to, to, the, to the extent that we are alive, we must find a redemptive course. There must be things that, <laughs> uh, wait, 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 but I, I did, just a minute, just a minute. There, there, there must be things that we, we should be able to talk about 
where we can say that, okay, look, this is, I mean, this thing is ruined. This is how to rebuild. And that, that's, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to get you to talk about. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, please. Remember, I came into the public space in Nigeria in February 2015. From that time up until date, I warned Nigerians each and every time they were getting to junctions and they were about to make errors. I warned our rulers, I warned the people themselves. Over the years, each and every critical moment, I did not find the peace of the grave. I kept my mouth open. I never kept quiet. And each time, I also offered solutions. I didn't merely lament about the problems. I went further. I wrote down the solutions. So I have never been quiet. I even participated in the last election. I got involved. So I have never been quiet. And I offered solutions. And this time again, I'm not shy. It's the same solution. That's why I keep saying that we are lying to ourselves when we look at sectors. Our problem is systemic. We need to be honest enough to tell ourselves that our situation is abnormal. And you cannot find salvation within the existing system. The existing system is incapable of delivering anything positive. And in the knowledge of that, I have said repeatedly over the years, we need a revolution in Nigeria. The only duty of the conscious is to ensure that that revolution does not become violent. We're already in a tailspin. We're already entering multiple cycles of violence. The only reason the people appear to be docile is because nobody wants to go and fight without purpose. So those who believe that our system is unsustainable as it is, and I believe that, I believe that the thing we should be doing is to be discussing the plan for the day after. Without a plan for the day after, what you have is chaos. Nkrumah was very specific. He said revolutions are brought about by men of action who act as men of thought. You don't go onto the street and start burning. It's a common word you'll be burning. But it's within our right to tell our rulers that we can no longer accept the way we are being ruined. It's within our right, even the democratic right of citizens. Even though you might not treat us as citizens, even our human right says that you cannot beat a child and then demand or dictate how loudly it must cry. The only thing that we have failed to do is to organize ourselves in a manner that forces it on the ruiners to understand that we are united in our demand. Look at what is happening in Maiduguri. They told you this dam was going to break. You were told, you knew, like less than a week before it eventually broke, you came out and said, your team of experts said nothing will happen. They don't care about us. And we can't continue in this manner. And what happened in Maiduguri is not unique to Maiduguri. You find it replicated across the length and breadth of Nigeria. There is no part of our country that, is, that has escaped this madness. So why has it become so difficult for us? Because, like you said, you are looking for elite. It is that elite class that should be building the consensus, that should be making the plan for the day after. But where are they? They are drinking 32-year-old whiskey. They are, chasing, they are chasing their next big kill. Those are the ones that should now be telling the people that they should be having a plan for the day after the mess that we have become immersed in. So when you say solution, the solution is clear. We simply can't continue like this. What you call a revolution is simply a turnaround. It's simple. The military can come with their banditry and then turn revolution into something that is supposedly violent because each and every military adventurer is a bandit. Call their people. They say revolution army, revolutionary army council. Bandits calling themselves revolutionary. So they spoil the name. But what is a revolution? It simply means a turnaround. You have to turn around. If you don't know where you are going, you must at least know where you are coming from. So, so that means that there must be some kind of a way to arrange this thing, which is we want to change the system. Now, you've, you've argued and submitted that, hey, look, I mean, we can't depend on the elites which is another way of saying that a lot, you, you are dissatisfied with the behavior and the conduct of a lot of them. But my view is that there are 
enough Nigerians who share your sentiment, who share my sentiment, that things can be fixed. And we must be able to find those people, men and women, and then in an orderly fashion, begin to pursue the, the ideals that we believe ought to be the replacement, uh, ought to be the, uh, uh, the, 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 the anchor for the new system. That's my point about the elite consensus. Of course, I know that, you know, uh, a, a lot of the description that you, that you have made about the elites, yes, there are those that fit into it. But I must tell you, uh, uh, Mr. Fowler, to me, that there are enough people who have the right mind, who have the determination and the resolve, okay? My point is that how do you get those people around? There must be some kind of orderly and something that is within the ambit of the law. Because, hey, in spite of all the disorderliness that you have described, we must find, you know, the, we, we still have to use some kind of uh, orderly atmosphere to arrange what it is that ought to be done because even you subscribe to the idea that you don't want a bloody, you don't want a violent re revolution. There are different prophets sent to different pulpits. I don't pretend to be Yele Jowere. I don't pretend to be Peter Obi or Donald Duke or anyone else. I am simply delivering to me. It might very well be that the totality of the purpose of my own life is to point out to the members of that elite class who still retain some basic capacity to think like human beings, to listen to the ranting of the like of me, who is not necessarily particularly sane. So they can then take that and understand maybe all I need to do is rant like I'm ranting so that the more reasonable and methodical who might be, because you remember, I think it was Prophet Elijah, he was crying to God, I am the only one that is remaining of all your prophets. God said, shut up. I have 7,500 who have not tasted of Baal's meat. So it is very possible. And I'm sorry. Yeah. I know as a fact that there are a lot of good Nigerians some of them completely silent, unknown. I'm just the one who is blessed to have cameras in front of me to speak for some of them. They just don't have the voice or they want to say it and they can't say it the way I'm saying it. But those who are hearing and it is given to them to organize, to begin to talk about the plan for the day after, they should get together and start talking. They are good men in this country. What kind of stupid country would I be in if I'm the only person who is capable of recognizing the truth? It would mean I'm crazy. It's already bad enough that I'm considered mad, but I know that there are multiple persons who also sees the things I'm saying and whose approach are completely different from mine. But it doesn't matter. Whatever approach they have, they are the ones who should now feel themselves propelled to take action. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, and, and, and I really, yeah, I, 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 I appreciate that point. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it answers, you know, uh, my, my question. Our hope and desire, uh, will be that we will be able to find all the different people, right mind, uh, thinking people doing their own different li uh, little bits that can bring, uh, that desired, Nigeria that we that we all carry now. Man, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dele Farutimi.